Well, on the road again today, heading up to Kansas City to work with a landowner. Just about 120 acres, new hunter, new landowner, and it's going to be a good day. Work with him, see if we can develop some habitat and better hunting. Well, Adrian and I just met. We're uh, getting ready to go tour the property, and we're just sitting here really diving into his specific habitat and hunting goals. You're fairly new to hunting. I am. Uh, started in 21. 21, yes. First... Har harvested his first deer in 21. You, your hunt was fairly short. For it was. It was. That hunt lasted about 15 minutes. <laughs> I drove at the top of the hill, uh, looked out left, looked out right, looked out left again, looked out right, and that deer showed up. And about a minute later, he was down the ground. So I don't think. You know, that, that kind of makes me wonder why I'm here, but because it sounds like he's got it figured out. But uh, we actually met at our field days just a couple months ago, earlier this summer. And he's smart enough, and wise enough to know that not every property is the same. It's not a cookie cutter pro, you know, project list. And so he's like, Daniel, can you come and help me understand what I need to do at my property? And not only that, but prioritize the projects. My job is to, to walk the property, answer your questions, but really develop a plan that helps you meet your goals and objectives where you're not wasting time and money and you can get to your goal quickly. Just kind of tell me just real quickly your specific hunting goals and your habitat goals. Just kind of break that down for me. What you're looking for right now. Yeah. So being new to hunting, um, the second year and the third year, the hunts did not go like the first year. I just did not walk out and find a buck sitting there. Um, it was a lot more of a struggle year two and year three to find something that, that was a, a shootable buck. Um, but would love to, we'd love to harvest a few does a year. A, a nice buck here and there would be great. Um, I expect as the family continues to get older and want to hunt, more, we'll have more hunting pressure on the property. Um, we'll have tend to have more neighbors that show up. We'll probably have less ag fields around us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know what I don't know, and I really don't want to go down a path of causing a lot more damage and not then, as opposed to just doing nothing or, or trying to do something a little bit different and and see a much better improvement. I, anything I basically any project that we do out here i'd love to know that it's it's a net benefit to the wildlife to the yeah. land i to... think you're on a r the right track okay you can tell from the windows it's kind of raining and there's actually some snow on the ground so it's going to be a cold wet day but that's a way better day to be out in creation than sitting in the office This is the this is the pinch point that I think I figured out. Okay. After going through the, the field days, this is a great pinch point. And right there, I just see there's a rub. There's an old rub where they're kind of cutting across that corner. And the reason this you've done he's done a great job identifying this pinch point. You're in Kansas City. Yes. Nor, northern Missouri, right down the Kansas line, and and as everyone knows, that habitat, it's, it's bottlenecks, it's pinch points. And that's what's key to getting uh, within range of deer. And this makes perfect sense. You've got this terrain, this, this hill right here with this little draw. And then we've got a habitat change of this field. So we've got two habitat features coming together with some terrain. And then back behind this, we've got another drain. And so it just it just pinches deer down, and this was a great find. You you did good, because obviously deer are moving through here, and we can see from tracks, deer are cutting through here, rubs. The, the problem here is, can we effectively hunt it? Even though there's all this sign, can we effectively hunt it? And this is on a slope, and the thermals, cool air sinks. Like, right now, if you watch our breath, If you notice, at first, it's kind of going up, but then it starts going down. 
Can you see that? I can. Oh yeah. It goes. But it, when you first blow out, it kind of starts going this way and then it goes this way. And that's because as we breathe, it's warm air. So it has kind of enough, just given the conditions today, to, to kind of start rising a little bit. But those thermals, that cold air that's sinking down this slope is dominating and it's pulling our scent down. So how I would hunt this is this is definitely a thermal game. And we're just five minutes into the tour and we may find better hunting locations, but right here, this is probably going to be a tough one to hunt because the wind may want to swirl a little bit, especially with the creek behind us, some ha that big open field, the wind may be ripping through there and then kind of hit this terrain and kind of do this. But on a day like today, where it's really cold and we know thermals are going to be coming down the slope and down this interior road, think about this road. This is like channelizing wind, just sucking it down. Those thermals may just actually pull down. And if you hunt on the downhill side here and let deer cross above you, you may be able to effectively hunt this. But this is, this is probably more of a thermal game for sure. Limited hunting days. And you just wait till the right conditions where, just like today, where we know exactly where our scent's going. That makes sense. If you want to go up this way, are we going this way? Let's head up. All right. No, right there. Yeah. I think that's it right there, yep. All right, we just came to the edge of a small little hidey hole food plot, and there's two big locust trees. And I said, what's your plan on these locusts? And what did you tell me? Well, I'm gonna kill them <laughs> if I can. <laughs> and, wh and why do you want to kill them? They have, uh, they have claimed four possibly five tractor tires and ATV tires at this point, And I'm pretty sure that we'll lose a few more this year, so. So he's popping tires, locusts have a really big thorn and you know, they'll break off limbs and whatnot and they get these big thorns that pop a lot of tires and I'm sure we'll get mail. But deer love locust pots. They love eating those. Folks, look at this. There's not a lot of food out here for deer. And there's a pile of these pods laying on the ground. The, this is not feeding deer and providing high quality groceries for deer. So we're gonna target these um, pretty aggressive species that are nasties and aren't providing high quality wildlife. They're taking our resources from other projects. We're having to you know, have breakdowns. That's time in the field. We're fixing tires. Lots of tires. So we're, we're gonna terminate these trees and one way we're gonna do that is we can either use the hack and squirt method, or you can actually use a, a basal bark application where you take herbicide and you spray along the base of the tree. We have options. We know we need to terminate these trees and save some tractor tires, save some ATV tires. <laughs> and make some habitat. That's right. <laughs> All right, we've come up on a ridge and this is a big old oak that, uh, You've actually had a stand in and have hunted a couple times. Tell me about your hunting experience here. Well, I'm 0 for 4 <laughs> at the start. Um, we have uh, we hung that stand and it looked great. It faces east. It's uh, it's got a nice heavy tree that's against. It never moves around a whole lot. Lots of wildlife, uh, squirrels and stuff running around. Uh, but I walk up this hill and I can't seem to get up here without scaring deer. So three of the four times probably that I've been up here, I have scared off deer on the walk up. And surprise, surprise, they don't come back after yeah. I've scared them off. Yeah. I I really like this hunting location. Like there's a really good bottleneck here. We've actually got a really steep bluff right behind this tree. And, and every deer you've seen has been out this way right and on this, this slope over here because it the terrain is easier to travel so it makes total sense why we would put a tree stand here but it's not only a great hunting location but it's how do you enter hunt and exit without alerting deer and i think you've you've identified a great hunting location we need to refine our approach and our exit and, and the conditions that we're hunting this location. That way we can 
have those encounters because deer are obviously moving through here. This is up on top of a ridge. The wind is going to be much more consistent here. And, and I think we talked about what kind of days you were hunting this and yeah. you said very little wind. Little wind. And so even on those lower wind days that even though we're on top of a ridge, those low wind days, that wind can kind of die down a little bit and drop one way or the other. So probably some swirling winds under those conditions just a little bit. So we need to wait for those really strong winds that have consistent wind direction to carry our scent. And what we're actually going to do, this is a great little spot to put a little hidey hole food plot. And you can kind of see back around us here, there's, there's enough opening up on top of this ridge. You can see around here. We're going we're gonna to create a little hidey hole food plot. And we're going to kind of give a reason for deer to come and go. And we're going to put up some mole trees on these edges and we're going to learn which direction deer are traveling and when they're traveling. Is this an afternoon hunt where deer are you know, coming from the north, they've bedded over to the north and they're coming here to feed in the afternoon where you can approach from the south without alerting them? Or is this a morning hunt? It may be a great hunting location, but it may be a better afternoon location. I think you said you hunted this a lot in the mornings. In the mornings, yeah. And th and that may be that may not be true after we you know make the hidey hole we and we change the habitat. But this is a great pinch point. But we're really going to study deer movement and put that in into our trail camera placement and our overall habitat work and study how deer start moving through the property. Just we were talking about this off camera that. He was telling me a lot of deer were, were coming from this way, but I, I mentioned, I said, there's, we don't know why deer are, you know, coming from that direction. We're gonna create these bottlenecks, these destinations and habitat features, and we're gonna learn, you know, in a general sense, which direction deer are moving from food and cover during certain conditions, and then we can learn how to effectively hunt these locations. And, and that's all about putting this, this plan together and why we're out here today. What, what are you seeing so far from our, from our tour? A lot of things that, um, that I just hadn't considered. So for example, if you ask the question, what, deer are the, what direction are the deer moving up here? And I couldn't tell you because I didn't know. And now I'm like, well, we should, that's a great question. We should probably find that out. Um, I had probably given up on this tree location this year. And I don't know if I'd ever hunt it again, being over four and scaring deer off three of the four times coming up here. But I guess getting that information, yeah. just on. getting a, another point of view on this, especially someone that knows what they're doing. Um, I, I have four hunting seasons under my belt, three, three or four hunting seasons underneath my belt at this point. It's, uh, it's amazing what I, trying to learn that, how to hunt better and what I don't know. <laughs> so this is, this is a, a really great experience and I'm excited to put some of this into practice. And you've come a long way in just a few years, it just as we've talked and I've listened to your hunting stories and why you've put some blinds in some places and have shifted around, you're doing a great job and you're on track. And I, I think it's just, it's gonna keep getting better and better. Awesome. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, PH Outdoors, Moultrie Mobile, Steel, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, Fourth Arrow, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. So we've moved into the timber and we're actually down in the bottom right now. And, and we're talking, as we're talking about prioritizing projects, I, I shared that you know, off camera just a few minutes ago that you know this, this bottom, is there's a lot of water running through here and we're seeing some species that you know, as this water comes through, we're gonna carry pretty you know aggressive, nasty species down here uh, with water, the seed. And so we're gonna focus a lot of our, our big habitat projects further up on the slope save this bottom to really do maybe later on once we get everything else really cooking 
because if we open this up at first thing, well, now we got a lot of sunlight down here and we're kind of playing catch up and we're going to other projects and the for whatever reason the conditions aren't right the first or second year for a fire or schedule or whatever well now we got sunlight we've got a lot of moisture down here those really invasive aggressive species like cerisa and some multiflora rose and our honeysuckle they can just really blow up down here and now you've got a big control problem and now you're spending a lot of time and energy just controlling species uh, trying not to make seed where you could be putting that into other projects so this is probably one of the the last projects we'll do just uh just getting ready to climb out of this bottom and i think we're gonna go up on top of this ridge and, and see what we have and, and what we have to work with this is just a lot of stems yes, so a lot of grasses and forbs here, we're, you know, we we're talking about clean slate and what I really like to see is we don't have a lot of nasty species in here so far. So we're, that's good news. We can easily convert this and we're talking about maybe adding some acres of food plots and, and really discussing how many acres do we feel comfortable planting? Do we have time to plant within the budget? Things like that. And we're trying to figure out how many acres we can plant. And then I'll design kind of where those acres of plots will actually go. And then the rest of it, gosh, we can use fire out here and turn this into great native habitat just like that. We don't have to kill trees. We don't have to hack and squirt. We don't have to wait, you know, almost a year for or more than a year for some trees to die we don't have to worry about that just with a snap of our fingers and dropping a match at the right time we can get some habitat rolling in this area you can see we've got a seed bank we've got sunlight reaching the ground but we need fire in here because if we don't get fire in here and manage this appropriately we will start looking like the rest of the timber and have a bunch of sprouts coming up hardwood encroachment and we will lose this and have to do a lot of work to reclaim it so this is really exciting because you can easily make some big improvements fairly easily and quickly and and get closer to your goals so I, as, as we're walking I, i've always said you know don't hold me to what i said you know around the last tree when we came up over the hill and we saw all this, I just started, you know, kind of drooling and getting wide eyed because we've got so many acres to work with. And I, I haven't, you know, the whole plan hasn't come together yet, but we may not do TSI in the timber. We may not need to, to worry about those acres. We may focus a lot more energy and time out here because we get more bang for our buck or for our time and maybe five ten years down the road once we've got this cooking maybe we go in there and we say hey that's that's 20 or 30 acres that we can add to habitat but we want to get as many acres as quick as we as we can because that's where we're going to start seeing those those changes quickly so that's all part of today's tour and, and trying to understand getting boots on the ground not just looking at the map but getting boots on the ground and and really evaluating the property and saying, this is how we prioritize these projects to, to get you where you want. So this is this is really good. And I'm, and I'm excited to see a lot of Forbes out here. You said it gets really tall in the summer. Tall, yeah, a lot of Forbes, grasses. We have diversity here, but we, we need to keep managing and maintaining this because we could very easily lose this. So we're in one of Adrian's food plots and this was uh, a corn bean rotation ag field before you bought it. That's right. That farmer had been disking and disking and disking. And of course, you're really interested in soil health. Yes. Talking about getting a no-till drill and, and trying to improve the soil. And I've tried to pull up a few clumps 
the ground's just a little too frozen, but the soil that is exposed that I can see laying on top, it's just, it has no structure. And it's just very compact and, and water's not going in. It's actually pooling in some of these places. And I know the ground's frozen a bit, but just look at the soil, there's no structure. And that's because it's been disked and disked and disked over and over. And that, that soil structure is just going down. And, and you talked about the reason the, the farmer stopped planting this yes. was he was getting low yields. He just, it wasn't worth his time coming in here to farm this. And, and the soil has been degraded and such. So we're gonna turn that around. We're gonna get, um, you looking at green cover seed with blends and, and trying to get some blends in here, a no-till drill and improving the soil health so not only do deer have high quality groceries, but we can get those microbes working. We can hold soil. You, we talked about the drought this summer. Yeah, right so, here. So many people had that you know, wicked drought in the late summer and their, their fall crop just didn't you know, come in. And, and rain is key, soil moisture is key. This was actually a later planting it with, was. with some rye. Rye, yep, came in with some cereal rye because the stuff I planted in August, it, we got a little rain, sprouted, came up. We had several days of 100 degree plus temperatures and it just killed it. it yeah. There was just nothing left. And to get what I could out of it, we cereal rye was available and I just dumped it on there. Yeah, and it's done acre. great. Cereal, cereal rye it can be a great one to for those type of situations to fill in gaps, those later plantings when you can time it with a rain, but other species aren't gonna mature in time before frost, cereal rye is a great component. But imagine if we had healthy soil, we would have been holding some soil moisture and you had a no-till drill, may have been able to actually have a fairly successful crop. Still still water is, is key, guys, but if we can hold some soil moisture with healthy soil and good soil structure and microbes and get that biology working and, and have roots growing as many months out of the year in the soil, we can hold more water longer and we can get through some of those droughts that with this disc type soil that's just dead, it was probably just dry as concrete. Yes, that's exactly what I would describe it. It was like concrete. And then we didn't even talk about that, but I was just listening <laughs> exactly to right. knowing the drought and what this soil looks like. So just, just know there's some great things coming up. I'm super excited. This food plot's going to turn around. Um, deer are obviously browsing in this because this, this is food. We've got some ag uh, around us, but they've harvested the crops. You have some food here. It's obviously been browsed very heavily. So we know after the crops are harvested, Food is king, and if we can have the best food plots in the area, best food source, we were talking earlier, muzzle loader season may be some great hunting and may, maybe some of your yeah. best hunting, because if you have the best food sources during the late season, muzzle loader, the alternative season here in Missouri, that may be some of the best hunting to come. So this food plot, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to look very different here in a couple of years, because you're gonna you're gonna turn this around and this this is gonna be awesome we just saw a couple deer and you know they they were in here in this timber which you know this time of year there's not much cover it's cold out here cold and rainy and there's no cover and they're they're tucked up somewhere in here in this timber and you know we we spooked them up and they, they took off running and you know you could see those deer a long ways off and they had to run a long ways before they felt secure and felt like they were back in you know quote quote cover so our plan here is you know this, this timber's a little different wasn't obviously probably logged as hard as the other portion of the property as you can tell there's there's larger trees here larger oaks um actually some hickories and oaks and different species in here and they're they're more mature but the terrain is much steeper and it's harder to log so we have more species larger trees this area is going to be easier to do hack and squirt we can cover more acres terminate some trees get a lot of sunlight to the ground quickly 
and make some habitat where those deer, when they're seeking cover this time of year, these cold winter days, they're gonna have it. But we're still a few years away, but it's coming, don't you worry. We're finding a lot of sign, a lot of scat, a lot of rubs, scrapes. There are scrapes that are open, of course, we're post rut, you know, after the peak of the rut, but you know, doe fawns can become receptive when they reach 65, 70 pounds. Um, you know, scrapes can still be used year round. They can be used right now. Some of this sign is in areas we just can't effectively hunt. It's just, it's off the side of the slope or, you know, like this little ridge. There's a heck of a trail coming up this ridge, but it's just, it's difficult to get in here and effectively hunt. So let's, let's make some habitat back here. And then let's get up on top of this ridge where we can enter on a good wind and we get off one side or the other, we know exactly where our wind's going, especially when we open up these trees and we can allow that wind to, to move through here more freely and not just swirl around tree to tree. That wind's gonna be more consistent when we open this up and uh, let, deer, let deer feel comfortable where they are. And then we're hunting these edges where we can effectively get in and hunt, let those deer come in, get within range, and uh, that's, how, that's how we're putting this hunting plan together, given the terrain and habitat, especially in this area, but lots of deer sign and uh, super excited to see what's to come. There's a rub right there. Oh, there is. I mean, you could set a blind up there yeah. and close it off for firearm hunting and you'd probably catch a deer crossing right in, right in through here. Yeah. Just finishing up today, uh, real quick, just like the top one or two yeah. things through the day that just kind of was the eye opener for you yeah. or that really resonated for where you're going and looking for. Well, it was putting effort where it's probably most needed. And yeah. my plan coming out here before I had a chance to talk with you had me putting a lot of effort into areas that probably weren't the most effective. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how do I improve a small area of heavily wooded area of heavily wooded um, overgrown stuff when I could probably yeah. be spending more time in the field that yes. had already been done, which makes sense probably to say it now out loud. But at the time, it just I was like, okay, well, I should be back here in the woods because that's where the deer live. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and this is great because uh, you might save me. I don't know how many hundreds of hours you might save me <laughs> dealing with stuff that probably at the end of the day didn't make as big a difference. Once we saw the whole property and, and the number of acres that are already open and we can easily change that into native habitat or food plots and we can get a lot of acres quickly. Well, is it worth the 10 acres of TSI and the amount of time and energy it would take to, to open that up? And, and for every person, that's, that's a little different. But for the number of acres you have, we've prioritized and said, that is the, like the last thing on the list. You could sit back for 10 years. And if you say, you know what, I just need something to do today. That's, that's on the list. Go do that. But is it going to move the needle? Probably not. Would it create some more hunting opportunities? Sure, absolutely. And, and we've discussed that, opening it up, being able to see further and more hunting locations, but really diving into your goals and, and what helps you uh, prioritize your time and your resources. I think that was one of the big takeaways today. And of course, it doesn't end today. You and I are gonna be talking. Right. I've, I'm gonna make him a map. And we're gonna go over this map and then He's, he's got my phone number and email. And we're going to be talking for years to come about this habitat project as, as he knocks out projects. Hopefully he's sending me pictures of deer and turkeys shooting and fresh venison on the ground, you know. And But it's it's all this, this entire process of helping you along the way with these techniques and answering questions, sending pictures back and forth, this communication. That's what it's all about. And, and while you're out there, you're going to be enjoying creation. Absolutely. And I'm going to be enjoying it by all the pictures and videos you send me. And hopefully we'll be back here to share an update 
uh, down the road. But, you know, we've had a great day today. And I hope you're able to get outside this week also and just enjoy creation. Maybe look over your property, try to design some habitat improvement projects. Uh, but no matter what you're doing, slow down, listen to the creator and the purpose he has for your life. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.